Uh, glad to see the turnout tonight. A lot of people were turned away at the door because we're at capacity. Um, I just want to tell a little story. When this was about to be advertised on the university's WILL radio program, <coughs> they refused to advertise it because they looked at the title and said, no, 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 we're not advertising that. <laughs> so I got a panic call from the deputy director of the Center for Advanced Study. What do we do? So I said, I looked at the subtitle. I said, well, advertise the subtitle. <laughs> and the response was, no one would be interested in that. I said, well, be provocative or be dull. <laughs> uh, good evening. I am, my name is uh, Leon Dash. I'm a professor at the Center for Advanced Study, which is sponsoring tonight. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's talk, the seventh Chancellor's CAS Special Lecture Series. This series of public events was inaugurated in the fall of 2005 and is the brainchild of Chancellor Richard Herman, who unfortunately could not be here this evening. Knowing the center's mission of showcasing faculty excellence and achievement, the chancellor requested our help in developing a new lecture series that would enable our campus and local public to hear firsthand and in layperson's terms the current research of our most recently celebrated faculty. Our university has an extraordinary wealth of distinguished faculty members, but the unfortunate reality is that our own campus and local public rarely get a chance to hear from them. When they are not in their labs, offices, or classrooms, these faculty are bus have busy schedules presenting papers to publics and in other cities and countries as ambassadors on behalf of this university. The Chancellor's CAS Special Lecture is now in its fourth year. We have heard from an entomologist, food scientist, two historians, psychologists, and physicists. These scholars from such diverse fields have one thing in common. They are all eloquent and articulate representatives of some of the most innovative and creative work in their respective fields. This evening, I'm particularly pleased to introduce my good friend and colleague, James Anderson, the Gutzell Professor of Educational Policy Studies. Jim received his doctorate in the history of education from the University of Illinois in 1973 and joined the faculty here the following year. He, was, he has received many awards and commendations for his research over the years, too numerous to list here. I do want to mention his election last year to the National Academy of Education, the highest honor in the field of educational scholarship. Jim is the author of The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935, which received the Outstanding Book Award from the American Educational Research Association. His new book, No Sacrifice to Great, the History of African Amer American Education from Slavery to the 21st Century is currently in press. Besides numerous published works, he has also advised and participated in various PBS documentaries, including School, The Story of American Public Education, and the 2007 Forgotten Genius, the Percy Julian story. I hope, all of, I hope that all of you have had a chance to view these important documentaries on WOILL TV. Jim has also served as an expert witness in a series of federal desegregation cases, including the recent University of Michigan affirmative action case, Gratz versus Michigan. And now please join me in welcoming Professor Anderson, whose talk is from Looney Coons to tacos and tequila, the aesthetics of race in middle class America. Well, <clears throat> good evening and thanks for uh, taking the time to come out and share this um, talk with me. Um, this actually started in a class that I teach 
called <clears throat> Race and Cultural Diversity in America, EPS 310, that I have a lot of fun teaching. <clears throat> um, when they first called and asked me to do this talk, they said, pick something from your research. And I thought about that, but I had promised the EPS 210 students that eventually I would do a lecture like this for the class. Now, <clears throat> it began when we had the tacos and tequila on our campus, and we had a discussion in class. And some of the students were saying to me that, uh, well, this comes from rap videos and hip hop culture. We're only doing what we see that's being done in that venue. And I said to them, no, it actually comes from minstrel. And there's a long tradition of this. Well, they were unaware of America's menstrual tradition in the first place. And then I started to talk about some of the stereotypes and the um, uh, politics of menstrual. And I remember saying to one student that stereotypes have meaning in context. And so one of the reasons that people respond to things when they're done in this context is because they fall on fertile soil. And it's like pouring salt on the wound. And I gave them the example of mine being in China. And I said, I was there for dinner. And the Chinese told me they had something special for me that evening. And I said, OK. And so I was at the table, and they had it all covered up. And when they removed the top, it was watermelon. <laughs> and I told them, I said, at that moment, I knew it had nothing to do with the stereotype. But if that was the same thing being done in the US by our president, <laughs> I would have had a different reaction. And one of the students says, what is this thing with watermelon? And I realized that I was talking to a generation of students who really have little or no knowledge of the history of American menstrual shows and so forth. And so I said I would do it. And then I started reading a lot on this subject. And I should point out that this title is not of my own making. Uh, there were influences along the way. <clears throat> there are a lot of good books on blackface. Uh, but there are two pieces of literature that really helped me to get to my subtitle. <clears throat> There's a wonderful dissertation in an article that's been published on this by Stephanie um, Dunson. It's called Minstrel in the Parlor. 19th century sheet music and the domestication of blackface minstrelly. And what she points out in this dissertation is that at the turn of the 20th century, in the late 1890s or 1900s, with the expansion of the piano and the huge, huge market of publishing sheet music, that this came into middle class homes and became performance in the parlor of middle class America. And well, that is very interesting, because normally we associate this with working class origins. And a lot of the books on blackface has to do with relationships between the white working class and African Americans. And also I read, which was a very insightful essay by David Rodega, Professor Rodega, who's in our history department, about modern blackface minstrel. And I want to quote what he said in that essay and that really made me rethink the works that I had read on the subject. Quote, those black-faced party goers are routinely criticized as departing from the traditions of a liberal and inclusive university. They ought to be criticized, but so should the traditions, which are in truth anything but anti-racist. At their liberal best, such traditions reproduced and recreated white supremacy. And I thought, that is really insightful and very interesting to, 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 to look at. And not that I'm going to be able to give an answer here, <clears throat> but it reshaped my thinking about the origins, the formation and development of this whole tradition, and to locate, or at least to look at its evolution within America's middle class, and to see what it says about our educated environment, college educated environment, and if we find within that development some answers as to why this continues to be prevalent in campuses across America. Now, <clears throat> when I was looking for a title, I, these are all sheet music covers from the era 
that was published by the millions and were on the pianos in homes across America. And the performance was in the parlor of middle-class America. And so I saw Looney Coons, and I was trying to decide between Looney Coons and John Philip Sousa's Shuffling Coon. And I decided to pick Looney Coon. And that will be clear a little bit later. <clears throat> now, the language, as you know, historians, we really try to create the times and even the flavor of the times. So I'm not going to say the C word or the N word. Uh, I'm going to say the words that were said in the times, which were coon. <clears throat> so when I started to do this presentation, I thought, OK, why did I get this information? And I remember that our library has a very rich collection of sheet music, maybe 150,000 copies or more. So I got my colleague, Professor Chris Spann. <laughs> and I said, let's go on a research trip. <laughs> I took my camera, went to the library, and I said, I'm looking for you know, this kind of sheet music about minstrel. And they said, well, we have like 150,000, I don't know, up in the, up in the um, library here. And I said, well, can I go up? They said, no, you can't go up. <laughs> you have to uh, tell us what you're looking for. We'll bring it down. And I said, well, is it categor categorized by subjects like race and ethnicity? They said, no. <laughs> so they, I, I noticed, they said, but we do have a, a search on our web. So I told the librarian, I said, well, type in coon. <laughs> and she said, how do you spell it? And I thought at the moment, I said, you know, if I was her and there was an African-American male of my height and size standing over her, I wouldn't acknowledge that I knew how to spell it either. <laughs> so I spelled it and all of these sheet music came up. And so I was trying to think of things that would pull up the, 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 the stereotypes. So I said, type in watermelon. Then they came up. So I said, type in nigger. And she said, you type it in. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, I, I typed it in. <laughs> and I said, <clears throat> and you got to type it, you know, N-G-G-I-R, N-G-G-A-H, N-G-G-A, because they're all the different kinds of spellings. And one of the points I wanted to make to my class that, you know, the rappers or rap video, they didn't invent the spelling of this. It's spelled a, a hundred different ways, or however way, many different ways you could spell it at a much earlier time. So I decided to go with Looney Coons. Now, as I began to research this, I realized that there is really a important void and I study of this because almost all the books that I read, with exceptions of books like John, uh, no, Robert Lee, that, uh, which is on the Oriental and looks at uh, popular culture and the use of menstrual <coughs> among Asian Americans, but almost all the books are really on blackface. Uh, and that really narrows our understanding of what is going on here. So a lot of work needs to be done and because it's global. And <clears throat> the minstrel of the time, and you can see the dates, had to do with Buddha. <clears throat> there is the Oriental Kun, and there are no African Americans in the picture. <clears throat> That's 1899. Baghdad, 
1912. Ashi, Africa, 1903. And that's not about African American, it's about Africa. The missionary flirtation. Yeah. Now, these things are interesting to how people are framed globally. In this case, I decided to read the lyrics. This guy here, I guess the best name is the old geezer. <laughs> he is in the Fiji Islands and he's excited. But she has a dilemma. The dilemma is whether she should marry him or have him for supper. Here you see his boots and bones on the ground. <laughs> so you know how she resolved her dilemma. <laughs> but he is minstrel in 1901, framing global views about people around the world. Havana Rose, Cuba. In Japan, my Hindu queen. the heathen Chinese. Now this is an interesting one here because one of the things I want to emphasize is that you know, much of the work on this has to do with the psychological dimensions and, uh, and, 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 and they are interested and very uh, insightful. Lot, for instance, um, in uh, uh, Love and Theft, really sees Minstrel as a kind of contaminated love in which the white working class <coughs> Uh, expressing this mockery and, and, and mimicry of African Americans, but at the same time, this fascination with their cultural pra practices. So the love and theft title sort of indicates some kind of psychological identification with uh, African Americans. Well, first place, menstrual is not just about African Americans. It's about the whole world on a global scale, and as we will see domestically, it is also about all groups. Now, what I want to emphasize is that the role of minstrel as popular culture and being a part of the most important political discourse in America from then until now, and to weigh in on its usefulness as part of political ideology. And this one here, <clears throat> it's really a story about <clears throat> a Chinese uh, person who is gambling with these uh, white men and the performance then portrays him as devious, as underhanded. You can see the cards uh, falling out of his hands here where he's cheating. But then it goes on to say that the Chinese are running American labor and undermining good jobs for white workers. But what was interesting here was to see the heathen, and of course, Chinese is always, throughout menstrual, you seldom, you occasionally see Chinese, but mostly you see this spelling, Chinese. In 1870, there's a debate in Congress where Charles Sumner proposes to amend the Naturalization Act. And the controversy within the halls of Congress is about the Chinese and where the Chinese immigrants would be eligible to become naturalized citizens. And some is asking Congress to remove the word white from the 1790 Naturalization Act, which says that only whites can be naturalized as citizens. And the debate is really over the Chinese. Chinese. The opposition to them goes not only with labor, but the notion that they are the heathen people that cannot be assimilated into American culture. And in the midst of this debate, this emerges in the same year as part of popular culture to frame the Chinese as the heathen Chinese, to explain why immigrants from Europe can be naturalized as citizens, but not immigrants from China. The question with African Americans is that they know that the 14th Amendment has granted citizenship to African Americans. But there's still a question as to the level of that citizenship, first class or second class. So this minstrel performance here, every race has the flag but the coon, 
literally says that the American flag is not the flag of African Americans, and that flags really do identify along racial lines and not merely along the lines of citizenship. The use of blinky, winky, tinky, and chinks was quite prevalent in minstrel uh, throughout uh, the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. And chink begins to be adopted in ways that would last into the 1960s. It was really about this time in the 1920s that a high school, not far from here, Pekin High School, changed its name from the Celestial Dragons to the Pekin Chinks. And that lasted through until the 1960s. Uh, and I used to, when I first came here uh, to graduate school, I went to, they were holding the high school tournament in Assembly Hall. And they were playing, and there was a time when they had those jerseys with the flaps, and they would have the name on the back, and they had chinks written across that. I remember saying to someone, is there some other meaning of the word chink? <laughs> and he said, not that I know of. And I would think, well, how would they boldly do this? And then when you go back to this time period and see just how prevalent the use of images and words were throughout middle class homes, what the minstrel performances did, particularly in the parlors and in, in, uh, and, and in the theaters, was to suggest that this is really the right thing to do. Yeah. And so people started to change their names. Uh, it was also during the same time period that, of course, we went to Chief Alanawe. <clears throat> They played an important role in defining race. And one of the things that um, um, I wanted to point out is that there were a number of court cases in the 19th century which America had to define race because there were laws not only regarding citizenship but testimony and later education and all other kinds of social and economic educational opportunities were tied to race. For instance, there was People versus Hall in 1854 in California. And California had a law that said that blacks, Indians, and mulattoes could not testify against whites. But in this case, it was neither a black, an Indian, nor mulatto, but a Chinese that was in question. And the California court ruled that although black that black was meant to include all non-whites, including Chinese. And even though Chinese weren't specified, they couldn't testify as well. And there were a number of cases with a culmination in terms of how the courts and the political uh, forces in the nation define race. One of the important ones was the Gong Lum v. Rice that really was decided in 1825, in which the Chinese in Mississippi who were forced to go to, who had really, had a tradition of going to schools for whites at a point when the state of Mississippi said you can no longer do that, you have to go to schools for colored because colored includes you. And Gong Long said no, colored means applies to Negroes, not to Chinese. Went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that the Chinese were in fact colored. But there's an interesting definition of race that comes out of the Mississippi uh, State Supreme Court. It, in order to illustrate his points that, um, that there were really only two races, the white race and the colored race. Uh, he pointed out to Gong Lam in the court, he says, Mississippi does not prohibit any marriage or social relationships between the Negro and the Mongolian races. And their search groups were free to maintain such social, including marriage relations, and I'm quoting from the court, court as they saw proper to enter into. Simply, they're saying that race is not about who is left out. It's really about who is privileged and that only members of that group should have those privileges and be able to testify, go to school together, and so forth. So <clears throat> the Minshuk then comes along and does a major job in defining race in a popular way to the rest of the country. The Navajo, <clears throat> the she's of the tribe they call the Navajo, face of copper shade, and every evening there was a coon who came his love to plead. What Minster does is to mix all of these groups in a way to say, you're all colored. And so the performances then does interracial courtship, dating and marriage. My Filipino babe, 
And of course, this is a time, 1898, the year of the Spanish-American War. And it really starts off with sailors that are leaving Manila, coming back to the US. And they're talking about their girlfriends. And then they said, there's a colored lad who has a photograph of his sweetheart, which they think is very funny. And the course goes, she's my Filipino baby. She's my treasure and my pet. There's no yellow gal that's dearer, though her face is black as jet, for her lips are sweet as honey. And a heart is pure, I know. She's my pretty, black face, Filipino baby. Which is to frame them also as part of the colored race. And these white soldiers on the ship are saying, it's OK if you have a Filipino sweetheart. Just don't have a white one. <clears throat> and as you can see, this continued, the wedding of the Chinese and the coon. And the faces on these people, well, speak for itself. A great big Chickapoo chief, because you can see down here that he's been uncovered. In both of these cases, they've managed to portray other kinds of stereotypes and character flaws. Um, in this case, it's actually an African American posing as a Chickapoo chief so he can steal chickens undercover. my Afro-Mexican queen. The theme continues. Now you have African-American women. I want a Filipino man. See the dates on 1899. The theme continues when you read the, the, the lyrics. And now, <clears throat> aside from defining race, they also go a long ways in defining social problems. May Irwin, who does this, is one of the famous uh, singers of the time. And when she did this, in, the New York Times did a review of her performance. And they pointed out that the days of the old plantation Negro, as they call, uh, who loved the melodies and the lullaby, was passing away. And that there was a new problem, particularly in urban America, and it had to do with the bad town Negro that was a grave social problem. And the minstrel in, and the popular culture comes on to really play this up across America and to millions of homes of this notion of the bully. <clears throat> Have you heard about that bully that's just come to town? He's around among the niggas and laying their bodies down. And so they really define them as extremely dangerous, vicious, and criminal. Now they do this from the cradle to the grave. There's an African-American baby who's born with a razor in his hand. Looking on your own coon baby, and sometimes I was, I didn't, I missed the point. As a slash right there, there's a razor. So even at her wedding, she's wearing a razor, which might have something to do with the frown on his face. <laughs> <laughs> that bad coon from Alabama uh, was really somewhat uh, chagrined to see so many references to Alabama. Uh, but there's a razor right there, and of course there's a gun at his side. And he's called, uh, of course, the rattling ragtime razor ripper. And when I say from cradle to grave, I really mean that. He is so vicious and efficient with the razor that he's going to start his own graveyard. And you can see the bodies behind him. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another thing they did was to really deal with the competition for jobs and for opportunities by really defining social worth. Who deserved opportunity and who did not? With the African Americans, this was a constant theme. Why was I ever born lazy? I live in lazy land.
being philosophical about it. <laughs> I wonder who it was that invented work in the first place. <laughs> Now, this is blackface, Lou Doc Stater, singing Everybody Works But Father. And thanks to YouTube, we can actually hear the actual ministerial performance of 1905. Every morning at 6 o'clock, I go to my work. Overcoat buttoned up round my neck, no job I would shirk. Wintry wine flow round my head, cutting up my face. I tell you what I'd like to have, my dear old father's place. Cause everybody works but father, he sits around all day. Feet in front of the fire, smoking his pipe of clay. Mother takes in Washington, so okay. does Sister Anne. <laughs> so everybody works with father, and you get this portrayal of the African-American head of the household, a male who is just absolutely lazy, who is really undeserving of opportunities for good jobs uh, because they refuse to, uh, to work. Now, another one is particularly, these things are northern urban, by the way, and in northern urban liberal middle-class communities. Uh, <clears throat> In the South, you see very little of this, and we also know that the questions of the color line are mandated by law, but not so much in the North, particularly in the late 19th century. In the early part of the 19th century, most, most Northern states, through the antebellum period, through the Reconstruction, and shortly thereafter, had their own Jim Crow laws, dealing with voting rights and interracial marriage and on and on. But in the <coughs> In the, the post-Reconstruction era, they started to change those laws and really to put on their books laws that <clears throat> were anti-discriminatory in, in many respects. But there was still a question as to how do you maintain racial separation. And so the minstrels come in in a way to, to really talk about norms and values of separation. And there's a series that really are devoted to children, and this one is about the this supposedly African-American child, that's not a child really, uh, <clears throat> uh, who wants to play and his mother calls him in and to tell him that, you know, it's important in America to stay in your place and that you shouldn't even attempt to try to integrate this playground. Uh, same thing with this one, Mammy's Chocolate Soldier. And it's really about this kid who is not allowed to play as they're um, they, 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 and you can see this is around World War I in 1818. And they're playing soldier, but he can't play. And she brings him in, and again, and these, by the way, are the people who are singing these songs. Uh, they go into blackface sometimes, sometimes they don't, most times they do, but on the sheet music covers that go to the homes, they make it clear that that's just a role I'm playing, this is what I really look like. He, again, you know, was you always chocolate uh, as a way to separate kids and to see him as an alien or as a very strange figure. Now, this is an interesting one here because it's apparent to everyone that um, uh, that at World War I, African Americans, you see the the USA here, and the early ones, you know, there's no flag, but now they're being asked to a tune of 370,000 of them to go off to do what? To fight, to make the world safe for democracy. Right. So the minstrel takes up this subject. He draws no color line. And here's what it says. <clears throat> Your granddad did his duty in the Civil War. He fell by his master's side, and I noticed they put him with a master when in fact there were almost 200,000 African Americans who fought with the Union and did not fall by their master's side. <laughs> Your daddy bravely did his best at San Juan Hill. You know that's where he died. So I know that you will do your duty too. And remember, son of mine, 
when the good Lord makes a record of a hero's deed, he draws no color line. So here on earth, <laughs> you know, in America, you cannot expect to return to anything but segregation. But remember, if you kill, the good Lord will draw no color line. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the writers about minstrel suggest that it ends around the 1920s and the 1930s. And I want to suggest that, in fact, it's a metamorphosis, a transformation, and it continues in very similar ways uh, into uh, our own present in different forms. Now, <clears throat> this, Whitmark and Sons and Remnick were two important publishers of the sheet music. In 1929, they're purchased by Warner Brothers. And Looney Coons become Looney Tunes. But anyway, these Looney Tunes were started in about 1930, are played in movies until 1969, uh, and they also are their own cartoons. And then they become censored, uh, and, 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 well, not so much censored, I should say stifled, um, in, in, the, in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement when people began to attack this uh, 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 sort of thing. Uh, and then it, it sort of fades. They now call the Sunset Eleven, but for a long time, we grew up watching these in a very unconscious way, really having fun watching these cartoons without an understanding that it was a continuation of Minstrel uh, and that Warner Brothers had actually purchased Whitmark and Remnick, took the sheet music, and then transformed it into Looney Tunes, and we were watching the same thing for a very long time. Now, we've got to be careful with this one. This is 1898, and I remember this one because, remember the Delaney sisters having our say? Well, they were having a discussion about when there would be, using that terminology, a Negro president. And Bessie said, uh, in a thousand years, and that was in 1993. And Sada said, no, 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 I think there will be one uh, much sooner than that. And at the time, Bessie remembered this minstrel show when she was young that they used to make fun of African Americans by saying the height of absurdity would be that someday an African American would be president of the United States. And it was called When a Coon Sits in the Presidential Chair. Now, <clears throat> part of it was, and this is from having our say, Oh my, what fun in Washington. I bet every coon from Coontown will be there. Oh my, what fun in Washington when the coon sits in the presidential chair. But then I thought, you know, I actually took this picture from uh, the U of I archives. But I also remember that the lyrics were there, and I didn't get the lyrics. And I wondered if their rendition was actually uh, true to form. So I was trying to get the lyrics. I can go get them eventually. I was trying to get them in the, in, in the last minute. 
And so I started to go on the web, and I saw on eBay that there was this reference to this. And I thought, maybe I could find it um, on eBay. Well, <laughs> it's selling for $1,350. It's actually free in the libraries. <laughs> I'm not drawing the connection, but it is selling for $13.50. And there it is over there. That's the true form, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I don't think they would know, and even in 1898 would think that in the 21st century, it would return us to the minstrel of 1898. But it does. 2009, the mayor of Los Alamitos had to resign because he sent out this email to the Republican Party saying, no Easter egg hunt this year. There's a watermelon patch instead. Which brought me back to the question that was asked by students, what is this thing about watermelons? That was a big part of the minstrel. I mean, people made, they were romantic sitting on watermelon benches. <laughs> I won't tell you who that reminds me of being in love. <laughs> I'll just go to Melon Time in Dixieland. I want my mammy. Now, this was 1921. This is 2007. Ghetto Fabulous at Clemson University. People ask, well, why do you bring this up? <laughs> you go, is there a difference here? <laughs> Blackface, Texas A&M, 2006. South of the border, Santa Clara University, 2007. You see this? You know. <clears throat> Across the country, we've seen the return of minstrel uh, and, you know, in, in classic forms almost. Um, I won't even look for this. They have south of the border, you know, find the illegal alien, um, Asia, the continent, ghetto fabulous. Uh, and they really range as broadly as they did in the 1890s and the 1820s, dealing with all ethnic groups and still defining colored, and still dealing with issues of opportunity and citizenship. These, in particular, have a much to do with the battles over immigration and the questions of undocumented immigrants and illegal aliens, so to speak. In 1993, the governor of California, Pete Wilson, proposed to change the 14th Amendment so that American-born children of undocumented immigrants would not have citizenship. And in 19, no, in 2007, uh, Tancredo introduced a bill into Congress signed by 85 uh, representatives to deny citizenship to American-born children of undocumented immigrants. And so, again, the minstrel performance are not just psychological, but they're part of the political discourse. And here they're saying, you know, South of the border, the invasion, the threat, the fear, really speaking to the political discourse around immigration, which was just like the heathen Chinese in 1870. And so the reason that these things continue and the reason they are reproduced, not just in working class America, but also in middle class America, is because they speak to the fears, the political concerns and challenges of this group 
And it does so in a way where you can weigh in on the political discussion and then turn around and say, but I was just kidding. But it's really more fundamental than that. And so, back to the beginning, from Looney Coons to tacos and tequila, the aesthetics of race in middle class America, I really didn't have to create any titles. I could just borrow from the historical evidence. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks uh, for your insight, uh, Dr. Anderson. I just had a quick question about uh, some of the things that you said at the beginning concerning um, the way in which menstrual touches so many different groups of people. And I was wondering whether or not the type of interconnectedness that you just promoted or illustrated through the menstrual, what, does, what effect does that have or might that have on race relationships in the United States? Does it bring, or uh, does it allow different races to see things through a, a more um, common lens, I guess I'm wondering? That's a good question. And I think it has a lot to do with the way that we teach it, because if you look at the scholarship, it tends to be rather um, isolated, that you have a book on blackface minstrel, and it's really about black-white relations, and almost no other group is discussed. And sometimes, um, like in the case of Robert Lee's, it's on uh, the title is Oriental, uh, and it has to do with um, popular culture and Asian Americans. And so we tend to write about it and teach about it in ways that are quite separate, unlike the way in which it actually unfolded. I mean, the people who produced this they didn't focus on this group versus that group. They focused on the whole world. And so there, there's like Allah, the foxtrot. I didn't show that one. Uh, and uh, Baghdad and Cuba and, and, and Egypt and Africa, they focused on the, on the world globally. And then domestically, they focused on all, the gr all groups. And I think if we would teach it the, the, the actual way that it happened, the way that it formed and developed, I think that would actually have a different kind of impact. I think people would see that it's not X's battle over here and Y's battle over that. And we've seen this across the country where you said, okay, that's south of the border, that's, about, that's your problem. Okay, oh, that's, about, gee, that's your problem. Actually, that is not the way it's developed. It's developed in a way that is, really is everybody's problem and it deals with challenges and stereotypes and, uh, and other sorts of things that really encompass the whole world. I was wondering um, how does, if we look at entertainment right now, how does, I mean the assumption that probably the students who are participating in these activities are probably getting them from the entertainment industry like they did with Minstrel. Um, have you connected yet, like if there are any, um, or have you looked at kind of the rap music and um, just general music and, and how that is continuing to perpetuate these, mm -hmm. some of these ideas? I, it was clear to me from the outset that rap music is not responsible for this because it's much broader than rap music. And when you look at the performances, the race performances across the country, Asia, the continent, uh, south of the border, um, Cowboys and, and I-N-J-U-N-S, engines. I mean, these are the race performances of contemporary time. Uh, that is much broader than, than, than rap music, and it's much more reflective of the broad range of both domestic and global concerns of the early minstrel performance. And then when you go through Looney Tunes, for instance, you're gonna see that in Africa and other places around the world. It just doesn't deal with the U.S. And so the contemporary race performances are much more consistent with the tradition of minstrel than rap music. Rap music has its own concerns and, and even its own faults, but to somehow suggest that it is responsible for contemporary race performances is really to misunderstand the historical context out of which these performances emerged. And I would say this, um, I don't know, I mean, sometimes we see things and people that really apologize by saying they didn't understand, like this guy stepped down uh, we saw that with uh, George Allen in the Makaka remark, where he actually claimed that he didn't know what the word meant. Uh, his mother had come from North Africa, it was used there. It may be, you know, I'm not, I'm not doubting 
him when he says he didn't know what it meant. But he knew this much. He knew that it was an Indian young man in the audience and that somehow it applied to him and it didn't apply to others in the audience. And so that may have been all that he knew about it, but again, it is reproduction of a tradition that has been in place for a long time. Thank you so much for such an interesting and engaging talk. Can you reflect on the extent to which you think that the, the, min, the early minstrels were um, shaping public opinion and to what extent you thought they were responding to public opinion? And can you also do that with respect to today? Yeah. My, you know, my argument so far, and, and, and I, you know, if, I, if I follow this, after all, this is a, supposed to be a class presentation, right? Not a long-term research project. It could turn into that, I don't know. But my sense so far is that they simply participate in a political debate, both then and now, that is national in scope and that is fundamental to the lives of all Americans, including the ones who are creating this. And this is their response. This is their part of the dialogue. And so I don't, I don't really think about the chicken and egg as to whether they're creating it or whether they're responding to it, but that it is a political debate, and this is a form of active participation through popular culture. Now, to what extent did it shape public opinion? These things are selling by the millions, and you have to imagine America where they are stacked up on the pianos and parlors across the country. And then the Looney Tunes that follow the Looney Coons that we all saw. And it's not sometimes a very conscious shaping of norms and values. Sometimes in a very unconscious way, you don't know as a child what you actually internalize from having watched that. And so sometimes in very subtle ways, they are shaping public consciousness. But we have to begin to think about how does this, if we use the metaphor of a virus, get a hold of us and then uh, metamorphose you know, throughout decade after decade that we are actually still doing this. Well, I don't think it's simply a legacy of the past. South of the border, find an illegal alien is in response to a contemporary crisis over immigration, just as the heathen Chinese was a response to an 1870 crisis and beyond over the exclusion of Chinese uh, as eligible for naturalized citizenship. So it's, part, it's an active part of, of a political debate. And that's the way I want to view it. Others are viewing it in a very different way. Uh, but I think this is, there's room to, to see it in this light as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for your talk. I, I have two questions. My first question is, what you were just saying about we are unaware of some of the ways that these images unconsciously reflect our values and things. Are, besides rap music, are there other things would, that you would suggest within the, you know, the terrain of public atmosphere that you, you would say that us, our generation, st should steer clear from? Because like you said, in your generation, you were unaware that things like Looney Coons shaped you and your values and your perceptions as a child. So I'm not sure if you have advice for us for images that we should steer clear from besides something like rap music. And just real quick, my second question is, tacos and tequila aren't, isn't just words on a screen for us as students here. These are real things that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. So for our peers and individuals, uh, all of us who are here, what would you say to us who are, when we're responding to people who say this is not a big deal or this is not important or why are you getting so offended? We don't have an hour long presentation to lay out you know, the ministerial show <laughs> to them. So, I, so I, honestly, what, what do you say for, to them so they kind of take, they understand some of the historical context of what they're doing and so we can all survive in a conducive academic environment? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, part of what I need to do, and I think um, um, so as you expand this, is look beyond um, the venues that I've looked at and I do recall other sentences. I saw, remember the New Yorker with uh, Michelle Obama and, and Barack on the cover? There's a very distinct minstrel thing about that. And when you go through these pictures, um, you, you, you see the kind of more militant African-American woman in all of these sheets with whether it's a rolling pin or even a wedding. See how she was built bigger and stronger and he was got, that performance 
is played out in Minstrel again and again. And if you go back and take a cook, another look at that New York cover, and you look at these things, you can see that sort of thing. They did one with Hillary and, 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 and uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton uh, uh, some years ago where they made them look Chinese and they put in the slanted eyes and the buck teeth and so forth. And so even some of our mainstream uh, publications, uh, either consciously or unconsciously, continue to reproduce uh, and frame race in much the same way. Uh, and so we have to look beyond uh, menstrual sheet music and television to a much broader media that had to do have to do with uh, with, with shaping these images. Now, <clears throat> you write it, 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 you know, and that's why this thing got started in my class was because I recognized for for the students when it happened that it was real and it was and 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 it was an abstract or something um, that wasn't a part of the everyday life. And I think one of the important things that that uh, you, and you don't have time to explain it, nor is it your responsibility to educate them about these matters. Uh, and that's important to convey, that you, know, you can point them in the right direction. Why don't you go and take a look at this, or take a look at that, and then come back and tell me if you still believe it. Because I remember the class asking the following question to students, because they kept saying um, it was all in fun. So I asked them two questions. I said, one, I said, when you were looking in the mirror, how did you know what to wear? How did you know? How did you know to put a pillow underneath to make yourself look pregnant? How did you know to put on these shirts and the sombreros? And so how did you know what to wear? I said, think about that. Don't answer now, just think about it. And I said, two, if the people who are the targets of this have been standing beside you in the mirror, would you have done it? Those are the two questions I ask. And the rest, they should responsibly educate themselves. Hi, thank you again for a very good lecture. Um, my question is, with the ex existence of things like the old Looney Tunes cartoons still available in internet media, mm -hmm. do you think that it's more of a positive thing in trying to break the conventions by seeing the things that we've kind of already done mm -hmm. and not repeat those? Yep. Or do you think that they kind of can have more of a negative method of, of kind of giving us an out? Well, well, at least we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's yeah. more positive or negative? In, it's in a good existence? question. I think my political bias is for the freedom of the internet. And I'll tell you why. Because when we went to some of these things, um, for instance, when we found this Lou Doc Stata uh, performance, and there was commentary down. And one of the, uh, I didn't notice this, but Professor Spann did, uh, that the person said, that's my grandfather. And started to weigh in as part of the dialogue. But what you see in the dialogue is some people saying, like with the uh, thing on eBay, saying, you know, approving of this. And, you, you, it's, and sometimes it's just blatantly racist. And other times that's, it's, it's naivete. But the, it was the back and forth where people would weigh in and critical commentary uh, on the internet as you got with the blog commentary after commentary. And I think in that sense, as long as people have a chance to challenge like that, uh, it's probably a good thing because people really were uh, making some very important points. Uh, now, you recognize that some people refuse to reckon with evidence and you can't change their mind. But nonetheless, I thought the give and take was good. <laughs> Great grandfather. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, I, I, I found those images very shocking, I've got to say, even today in this context, um, particularly uh, with the narrative that you're providing. But the question I wanted to ask was about the export of yes. American racism yes. and the globalization yes. of a series of stereotypes yes. from uh, Hollywood and from the, mm -hmm. the uh, political economy of the entertainment in industry mm -hmm. in America to, uh, to Britain to the BBC, mm -hmm. because growing up in the Antipodes, I remember mm -hmm. black and white minstrel show in the, mm -hmm. the 1960s and 1970s. Right. And right. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of circulation. Well, that's, an as of that's an aspect of it that I really discovered, but I didn't dwell on here, because the, between the, 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 the sheet music and the newspaper coverage, they tell you where the performance took place. And they took place around the world. They said in London or in Australia or in other places. It was really international in terms of the performance. So these sort of troops 
took these minstrel performers and took them around the world. And so, yes, it was the internationalization of minstrel uh, that took place. It wasn't just people at home publishing and creating lyrics about Africa and about Baghdad and, and Havana and Mexico. They also took the performances abroad. And that is a whole other dimension that I am aware of, but I didn't really have the opportunity to, to, to analyze. We're going to take two more questions. All right. My question is, in reference to the theme parties and in the context of the university, what ought to be the response of students, community, and the administration when these racial performances do take place within the university? Um, so just repeat that again. <laughs> just, would you ever repeat that? I, yeah. Just when thinking about theme parties within the yes, university the context, university. Okay. what ought to be the response of the administration, students, mm -hmm. and the community? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the response of the administration? Yeah. Well, one of the things I think we, we tend to do, um, for instance, when I was going through the web trying to get the pitches to do a sort of uh, interplay between minstrel in the 1890s uh, and the early 1900s and the blackface today, you could see on the websites where the colleges would announce that they had problems and then they would remove all the pictures. And I thought, this is, a, this is a reality that we have to face squarely. And, in, and administrators in particular should understand that, that you don't simply erase the pictures and hide the pictures and hope that it will go away. Because it's much deeper, it's much more fun. It's not just people having fun or being mischievous. It's really, an active participation in a political dialogue that is fundamental to the most important issues of the day, then and now, immigration, affirmative action, multiculturalism, diversity, issues that are really critical. And so those issues are not going away, and that particular form of participation in the debate is not going away. So the best thing to do is to leave those pictures up there I mean, you may cover the faces for individuals that are very young. Uh, that's why I didn't use any of the uh, pictures from this campus, because you can actually see the faces of students, and there's no reason for them to be subjected to uh, any further persecution. Uh, but nonetheless, you, even if you, you, know, you don't push this under the rug, because it becomes a necessary time for education, for confrontation, uh, and for debate. <laughs> There's one up there. <laughs> Hello. Um, besides what you just said about not pushing these issues under the rug, what solutions do, like, do you suggest that we do? Because there's no way that we can end these things without any solutions or without recognizing what the solutions are and trying to fix them uh, completely. Yeah, well, you know, I, want, I will, I'm not, I don't know if this is an answer, but, you know, I just recall being a student, when I was a student on this campus, the kinds of things that happened and the forms of discrimination that were even more blatant in some regard. Um, I remember Arthur Jensen coming to the law school to argue about the genetic inferiority of African Americans um, and uh, and having to deal with it. And, and one thing I learned from myself is that I was most angry the least that I was educated about something. Because I ultimately had to admit that part of my anger and frustration was that I wasn't sure just how to respond. Now, <clears throat> there's a story that I remember from uh, a young man in New York who wanted to become a member of the Black Panther Party. And he went down to, to join the party. And the Black Panther gave, went into his desk and gave him a, a stack of books. And he said, I thought this was the Black Panther Party. I expect to be armed to have a gun. And the guy says, that is your arm, armament. And that is your ammunition. And without that, you know, we really don't want you to be a member of it. So, you know, as much as this may turn the problem around, it's important for you to know because to know is to give yourself confidence. 
And when you have that kind of confidence, you confront the issue in a very different way. You're not flailing, you're not angry, you're not frustrated. You know, you really are confronting it in a very determined and, and, and confident way. So let's start there, uh, because the hopes that you might change somebody's mind uh, who is already determined to do something could just be perpetual frustration. But knowing what happened to yourself and knowing how to put what you confront in the context is a kind of confidence that keeps you going forward. And with that, I'm going to...